I think the training is real good so far. It really gives the soldiers an appreciation for jungle operations. The heat, the humidity, the type of vegetation, and the difficulties getting through it. It's a super experience for, uh, for any soldier. They'll learn a lot. They'll have a lot of uh, memories when they get back. Take a soldier, sailor, or airman, place them in a foreign country, and provide an environment for combat training, and the impressions will normally be long-lasting. Such was the case for Universal Trek 85 on the picturesque eastern coast of Honduras beginning April 12, 1985. UT-85, as it came to be called, involved about 5,000 U.S. Navy, Army, Coast Guard, Army Reserve, Marines, and Air Force working jointly with the Honduran forces. The two-week exercise was designed to demonstrate many aspects of a modern joint warfare scenario, including naval operations, Air Force strategic airlift, tactical, and close air support. Universal Trek 85 was the third exercise of its kind following Universal Trek 83 and 80 and was coordinated by the U.S. Forces Caribbean, headquartered in Key West, Florida. Task Force 141, predominantly the 101st Airborne personnel from Fort Campbell, Kentucky, was deeply involved in small unit training. Lieutenant Colonel Milton Menjivar, commander of the 5th Battalion, 187th Infantry, was leading the forces chasing the enemy through the underbrush. The exercise, I think, went rather well. The uh, squad leaders and the platoon leaders reacted very well. What you saw also here is an integration of the combined arms concept. We had fire support. We had the Marine Corps providing the amphibious fire support liaison. We are, of course, delivered into the area by helicopters. And I think that the 101st does this integration of combat power and the combined arms concept better than anybody else. We have, in fact, done away with the vehicles and the fire support that we normally would have within the battalion and have by force to use the helicopters as our air assets for transportation and their fire support. But as you saw here today, we are not only using the combined arms within the Army, but also within the different services and using both Navy firepower and the Marine Corps Anglico. What we did up here was a good, was good training because, as you saw, it allows for firing movement. Small three-second bounds, soldier gets up, rushes to the next covered position where somebody else fires and suppresses the enemy. But overall, I think it's good, excellent training, and I think the soldiers are well motivated. Lieutenant Colonel Menjivar says the tactics are the same for this kind of opposing force anywhere in the world. The difference is the tropical environment. But the training wasn't limited to learning how to combat a human enemy. In the hot Honduran climate, drinking water is a real necessity. Many times, water contains parasites and diseases that could cripple a soldier in the field. To counter this problem, enter the reverse osmosis machine. Spec 4 Van Leer of the 101st Airborne Division is learning how to operate the system in a real-world environment. They'll take out the water from the river, straight into the equipment itself, goes through a series of filters, and from there we add a couple chemicals, polyelectric light, chlorine, sodium hex. From there it goes through the membranes into the storage tanks. We have a maximum, maximum capability of 7,200 gallons. We have six storage tanks. From there we issue it out to buffaloes and an 8,000 gallon tanker. Before the water is put into our machinery back here, we take a sample out from the river and the 51 November is here. We test it for NBC agents, turbidity, any kind of agents in there that are harmful to us. We test it at least every other day, and we had the medics come out here and help us out. Out at sea, the Navy was getting a workout en route to Honduras. The nine ships involved in the exercise encountered UT-85 activity from the day they left port. They were also a staging platform for the 26th Marine Amphibious Unit with the troops from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and helicopter support from the Marine Corps Air Station's Cherry Point and New River, North Carolina. The Naval Task Force was led by the USS Nassau, with Marines also on the USS Ponce and USS Harlan County. On D-Day, April 23rd, 36 amphibious landing craft carried the Marines ashore for a beachhead landing at the Puerto Castilla area. The Marines moved in on the beach with helicopter support from their CH-46s, UH-1s, and CH-53s, which went on to the airport near Trujillo to conduct an assault there and secure the airstrip. 
I'm Captain Craig Fisher, Public Affairs Officer for the 26th Marine Amphibious Unit. I came ashore today to be on the beach with the news media who came down from Tegucigalpa and also to meet the DOD media pool who was embarked with the Marines and the Navy last night. Uh, we had approximately 50 news media people covering Universal Trek 85. The DOD media pool, which consists of 10 reporters and, and three escorts, two from DOD and one from U.S. Sinclant, will remain with myself and the Marines out in the field tonight. This morning when we assaulted, we had a simultaneous heliborne and amphibious assault. In other words, we had landing craft assaulting over the surface of the beach, and we also had a heliborne assault right here at this airfield at Trujillo. Uh, the plan of action calls for the rifle company that came ashore at the beach to link up with the reserve rifle company, and uh, what will happen is they'll link up, secure the objective, which, which are near a bridge, also secure this uh, uh, airfield, and also cut off any uh, entrance into Porta Castilla area, which is also a major objective uh, for the 26th mile. At the airport, a Marine disguised as an enemy agent is located and apprehended. Next, they secured an area to be used for the 101st headquarters. Still D-Day, the Marines move on to a bridge to the port where a single terrorist is located. He too was apprehended and the area secured. D-Day plus one, elements of the 101st Airborne Division Air Assault moved into the area secured by the Marines the day before to enable the Leathernecks to begin their redeployment out. They moved back and began their washdown procedures. Meantime, the Army forces began their counterinsurgency operations. These four days of joint activities involve both American and Honduran forces. One of the major stumbling blocks for the exercise was the safety grounding of the UH-60 Black Hawk helicopters. These choppers are normally the workhorses of the 101st Airborne. The loss of these aircraft was overcome by using Marine CH-46s, CH-53s, and UH-1s. UT-85 also marked the inauguration of the DOD media pool. Deployed with the task force and formed with members representing the civilian press, this pool provides media support to avoid the lack of civilian press coverage of military activities. The problems encountered by this first time out on an exercise of this nature will be addressed and used to improve the operations in the future. As earlier stated, exercises like Universal Track 85 provide a very impressive training experience for the troops. This because of the different climate and terrain and because of the attitude of most American military personnel. Nothing beats this kind of training we have right here. This is real world training, not in the United States. We're not, certainly we're not gonna fight in the United States, right? For Universal Track 85, I'm Air Force Sergeant Bedford C. Vickers for the Aerospace Audiovisual Service.